good. Testing. All right. Um, welcome to a year with Cinder and Sep at TWC. It has definitely been a very adventurous year, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Um, if I can actually get my slides to move. There we go. So basically what we're going to cover is, um, first and foremost, all these views are not from developer perspective. It's a typical systems administrator, storage admin, um, you know, comparing it to stuff that we've done with a lot of the other vendors and typical standard back office IT deployments. Um, how we came to evaluate our storage, what was the pass fail criteria, um, some different things that we're evolving through with IPv6 and doing traditional storage arrays versus grid storage, and then how we came about using Ceph. Um, also, we're in the transition of adding additional backends, and there are some kind of troubling issues whenever you do that. Who are you? Oh, by the way, I'm Craig DeLatte. I'm a senior engineer with uh, Time Warner Cable, and this is Brian Stilwell. Um, for those of you that don't know what Time Warner Cable is, we sell video services and broadband. Okay, so um, about a year and a half ago, we had an organ organizational change, and our new VP came in and said, hey, I'm going to change how we're doing everything. We're going to do OpenStack, which is great. So after like three or four cups of coffee in Google, I found out what OpenStack was. <laughs> so after we go through that whole transition, um, we came up with, yeah, we can do this. You know, we were a big EMC shop. We're like, yeah, it supports whatever. You know, they'll, they'll support us. We pay them enough money. Then he comes back and says, well, it has to, you know, meet X, Y, and Z. Then we start looking at this, and we find out that the matrix, a lot of things weren't necessarily supported, even though they said they were. So um, certain things like live migration, how it does snapshots, um, just different things. And it's definitely, if you go to OpenStack.org and you look at the Cinder matrix, it has a, a pretty intense, like, checklist of what's supported where. So um, basically, like, go down three months down the road, we're testing a lot of vendors. Um, we had, like, multiple vendors come in, install stuff in our lab. We're going through everything. Everything's working great. And then we start getting to, into issues because one of our things that we do is live migration. A lot of people in the cloud don't necessarily support this. It's the cattle versus cow. We don't need to actually, you know, we don't need to worry about this VM. They have one over here. So, but for us, it was a, it was a must have. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and also one of the things that also led us to this is the rack anywhere. Um, rack space, floor space, power, was definitely something that was an issue with us. Um, we were, you know, very, um, we had very restrictive power requirements per rack. So putting up a big, like, big iron array definitely did not uh, suit our needs. Plus, we have to go into multiple data rooms. Okay, so after testing out multiple vendor arrays and working with some very skilled Cinder developers, we realized that there are some um, shortcomings with how Nova does live migration. So we were at a scramble. We had a deadline. We had to support live migration. We had to deploy Cinder for OpenStack. And we came about to using Ceph with Dumpling. Um, basically, this was the only thing that supported, supported live migration at the time. Um, and we, it was kind of like an emergency ditch effort to just get live migration and OpenStack deployed. And it also allowed us to, you know, take, instead of going through a purchasing process, getting a lot more equipment, getting it racked, going through the network intake process, we had stuff racked that we could just steal and deploy Ceph. Okay, so this led to our first Ceph design, and this is where it went really wrong for us. Um, basically, our customers are used to almost unlimited performance. Um, we had a lot of arrays, we had a lot of RAM, we had a lot of fiber channel speed. That kind of went out the window. We stole some uh, Swift nodes and threw some you know, cheap SSDs in there for journals. And basically, at that point, we had Ceph. We're like, yep, we're done, we're good, we have live migration. Well, then you start getting into some of our customers who have unlimited performance needs, and they're like, hey, why is this slow? 
Um, so we kind of, in, by the way, this is a four node cluster, very, very small. So we ended up having tons of performance issues uh, down the road. So um, actually kind of backtracking, uh, we went through the live migration testing with Ceph. It was the only thing that supported us. Um, and I kind of covered that earlier, so excuse me. All right, so early life with Ceph. Um, it's challenging. It's awesome, it's great, but um, if you're not used to this and you're used to a lot of vendor support, you are gonna have some challenges. So um, certain things like out of family upgrades, um, they really, really do require a leap of faith. If you motor through, you're good. And usually that's what you do in your dev environments. When it comes to production, you build in a lot more safeguards. This can actually hurt you more than help you. Um, be prepared to scare your coworkers. I see some of mine out there and I cannot even begin to tell you how many times they're here like, is something wrong with Ceph? Uh, you know, we run Glance and we run Cinder on Ceph and out of nowhere they're here like, our customers are complaining. So, it, and they kind of, once they start understanding it, how the whole, everything kind of bounces out, they're a little bit more, you know, okay with how the whole upgrade process goes. And this is probably like, I don't think Eric's here, but one of our coworkers is very fond of animated GIFs. So during our first upgrade, we ran into some major issues and, and hopefully you're gonna take away from this and not do some of the same things we've done. But with your first production upgrade, this is basically how I felt and probably how you may feel. You're just kind of getting slapped around and you're kind of scared. And but like I said, if you kind of motor on through, you're pretty good. There we get an animated GIF. <laughs> okay, so our initial Ceph cluster was definitely, it was a small, it was inadequate. We kind of stole, you know, stole hardware from a different um, use case. Um, so we were like 60, OS, 60 OSDs, our journal ratio was five to one. We didn't even test out the uh, SSD card. So I know there are some other people in the room have, you know, they have great blogs on, hey, which SSDs, you know, do well, which ones don't. And yeah, we ended up with some that don't. Um, and our raw capacity and usable capacity is there. And we went with uh, uh, 7200 RPM ATA drives as well. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it off to Brian. So this is my first public talk, so I'm a little nervous. So, um, I've actually been using Ceph for a little over two years, but uh, about six months ago I switched to uh, working at uh, Time Warner Cable and came into uh, this cluster and literally the first day before I even had my email set up, we were running into uh, problems moving off of our uh, legacy hardware onto the uh, <coughs> new hardware, which was like a wholesale replacement of all hardware so we could actually return those nodes back to our Swift team. Um, so, it wasn't a very big upgrade, um, you know, but we did increase it by about 50%. Uh, the drives changed from, uh, you know, one terabyte 7200 RPM drives to 1.2 terabyte 10K SAS drives. Um, so we did increase the usable capacity up to 30 terabytes. So what went wrong? Uh, quite a few things. <laughs> So uh, we identified a, a few of them uh, right away, uh, like the journal ratio to uh, hard drives or hard drives to journal ratio was rather high, uh, five to one um, with 10K SAS drives uh, just didn't seem good enough. So uh, we marked that down as something that we wanted to change. Um, so this, you know, having that high of a ratio is actually, could work pretty well for uh, a cluster that primarily, primarily sees read traffic, but uh, with, a, you know, RBD, it's a little bit more write traffic, and I'm not quite sure what else I was gonna say there, but. Um, so, also one of the things we noticed was uh, placement groups. Um, we started with 512 uh, placement groups per pool, um, but with the size that we were planning on growing the cluster to, that was not gonna be enough. Um, and then one of the first major issues we ran into was the uh, VM's lost site of the storage. Um, this was actually a problem because we replaced every single mon node and all the new mon nodes came up with new IP addresses, which uh, Dan ran into over at CERN. Um, so we ended up having, well, I'll do that in the next slide, but 
Um, and then we also identified that you know, legacy tunables were enabled, so we had to switch that, which required some data migration, like quite a few of these, like enlarging your placement groups, lots of data migration, changing tunables, lots of data migration. And then uh, we lost sight of our storage again, um, which changing uh, the tunables, uh, the compute nodes actually uh, still had the old version of Ceph on them because we upgraded the cluster but forgot about the compute nodes. So they were no longer able to talk to the storage. So what corrections did we make? Um, so we started the ordering process to get more SSDs. Um, that takes a while. So we wanted to get that started right away. Uh, we start, reused them on IP so we could you know, actually get this cluster responding back to our uh, virtual machines again. Um, placement groups, um, so we increased those. I think we did it uh, like 64 placement groups at a time. Um, large jumps just completely killed our performance. Um, switched tunables to the Firefly tunables, um, which provides better data placement. And then also need to make sure that all systems were upgraded to the you know, version of Ceph, not just the cluster. Um, then a few of the settings we found uh, was setting no backfill, so when we were making all of our changes, we didn't want it to start the backfill process and then make another change and restart the backfill process. Uh, disabled scrubbing and uh, deep scrubbing, so that way uh, we don't have additional um, background processes using the hard drives while it's trying to uh, resize. And then we have a couple of ceph.conf settings, um, like reducing the number of backfills that can happen at a time to one, um, Max recovery or recovery max active. Uh, also set that to one so that uh, only uh, one recovery process is happening per OSD, and then uh, the recovery op priority to one, uh, which is the lowest setting possible. I kind of wish that there was some way to use the uh, CFQ uh, I/O scheduler to really make the recovery I/O like an idle, pro you know, level. And, but it seems like. Right now, the only way to do it is just reduce it to the minimum number you can. So then that led us to the second expansion because we actually needed you know, a little bit more storage. Um, so we actually had 20 nodes, but um, because we didn't buy the right number of SSDs at the beginning, we ended up having to borrow a bunch of those SSDs and put them into the nodes to get them to be the proper size. And so we actually have six SSDs now um, per, well, well, per node, um, with 18 OSDs per node. But we still had our original five nodes, which were you know, completely different configurations. So we actually reduced the number of used uh, hard drives so that we, we could get to the three to one journal ratio that we were shooting for. So this is actually a fairly big uh, jump in the size of the cluster. Uh, going from 75 OSDs to 189, and capacity, um, usable capacity went up about 150%, it looks like. But we had more problems, uh, different performance issues this time, um, and then we actually ran into a problem where uh, Giant had come out, and we were using a Ceph deploy, and uh, all of a sudden, these new nodes that we were adding were coming up with the giant packages instead of the Firefly packages, which the rest of the cluster was on. So uh, I believe that actually caused us a few other issues. So we had to make sure to downgrade that again. Um, so the corrections we made this time was we decided we needed a dedicated mon nodes, um, added a couple more options to uh, improve performance, which I've listed below, um, OSD recovery max single start, and uh, op threads equals uh, 12, and I tried to look those up to remember exactly they were, but they just slow things down a little bit more for the recovering process. Uh, and, let's see. and then we started work on replacing Ceph deploy with uh, Puppet Ceph so we could get a little bit more consistency with our um, packaged installation. <coughs> so we've actually gone through quite a few uh, different expansions as the uh, hardware's become available. So the SSDs finally came in. Uh, we added those to the rest of our you know, racked nodes, uh, which finally got us up to all 20 nodes that we originally purchased. 
the expansion was about 50%. Um, so it wasn't quite more than doubling that it was before, but definitely noticeable a lot of uh, traffic, especially since we had, uh, you know, our customers started using it more and more, so there was more traffic total, on, or more data total on the cluster. But still had some performance problems, that we, which we had to troubleshoot. Um, luckily, those are going away with a, as the cluster is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and then we also started uh, removing the OSDs from the, uh, from the servers. So that way, actually, let me move this. Yeah, so we, if you see in the top right, uh, the, just one level down, basically we dropped those down to like just the OS, like removed all the OSDs off of it, so that way we could reconfigure the hardware. So the corrections we made this time, uh, we started, well, yeah, we started working on this F deploy being replaced with PuppetSF, but we also had an option to, uh, when we bring in the OSDs, we bring them in with a weight of zero, because um, we found peering uh, during, um, like having a whole bunch of OSDs, like doing peering at the same time, uh, kills performance for our uh, customers. So that's the uh, OSD crushed initial weight is zero. And then the most recent one, which is also kind of the smallest, but it's actually just trying, finally trying to get our cluster into uh, the right configuration that we should have done in the first place. Um, so if you see in the top right, um, got three nodes now that only have the OS on them, and that gave us, well, well that gave us actually mon nodes, um, dedicated mon nodes, because we found uh, that yeah, having mon nodes on the same hardware as your OSDs uh, causes performance issues because uh, mon nodes use a lot of F-sync operations. And yeah, this upgrade was only what, seven or nine drives. So not big, but it's still something we had to do. And then, yeah, dedicated mon nodes, finally. And uh, so we actually use our mon nodes as kind of our admin nodes. Uh, which I believe a lot of other people also do, um, but this also keeps the uh, you know the admin keys like the keys to the cluster in a you know a single spot instead of spreading them out all over the place because we had well when I started we had them kind of scattered all over the place and that's just not good to get the keys away to the kingdom. So we have actually multiple Ceph clusters. So all the things I just went through we did twice. So once in east and then again in the west. Usually the second time it went a lot better. But we also have uh, two small staging clusters and two lab clusters, and each member of our team has the ability to create a virtual Ceph cluster inside of our OpenStack cloud running on top of Ceph. So I think Dan was saying he didn't understand what that meant, but it actually allows us to test things like, uh, you know, puppet changes and um, different ideas like uh, cache tiering and, I don't know, like, prim like primary affinity, I think it was. Um, I think, is this yours? No. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. So um, earlier I kind of mentioned about going to multi backend. So basically the next hurdle that we've run into, and this is something we just ran into I think in the past month in our lab, um, whenever you add in your second backend, all of a sudden your whole Cinder configuration changes. So um, this is kind of one of those you need to plan for it from the beginning. Um, the main issue is you take a lot of default values and you kind of take the lazy way out, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, and this hurts you because whenever you change your service type in the back end, um, whether it be a vendor or Ceph, you have RBD, SolidFire, 3 par, um, it changes how Cinder looks at it. It's no longer the default. And this can run into a lot of issues when Cinder is trying to move the LUN. Um, it thinks it's default, which is no longer a valid type, and you can run into a lot of connection issues. Um, so one of the things you really got to do is if you ever plan on expanding to a different tier or anything like that, even with an RBD, uh, you know, go away from the default right off the bat. It, it's going to save you a lot of trouble. Um, and not all lab testing is really going to, you know, reveal what's going to happen in production. Our lab cluster was you know, I think four nodes and we only had a handful of uh, OSDs and it doesn't equate to whenever you're moving PGs around and you're, it's rebouncing and doing failover testing. Um, it's not the same as a 30-node 30 30 cluster or even an 8-node cluster. 
So. Okay. So looking forward, um, we are looking at uh, providing a couple new storage tiers to our cluster because right now it's very homogenous. Um, so we're looking at an, a performance all SSD cluster and a capacity a large hard drive uh, cluster. Um, we're, list, we're you know, investigating a kind of emerging uh, drive technologies like uh, NVMe drives, uh, some of the Ethernet drives that are coming out. I'm pretty excited about those. And uh, see where new store goes. So you know, don't have to worry so much about journals, at least that's how I, I'm understanding it. So takeaways, um, don't start small if you're going to go big. Um, order the right number of and type of SSDs, because the original ones, uh, original SSDs in the Swift nodes just didn't have, or were really slow on direct I.O. Um, determine the right number of placement groups early, um, because having to uh, split your placement groups and expand on the new ones, just you're moving like all the data of your cluster multiple times. Um, you know, get dedicated mon nodes from the start um, because of the F-Sync uh, problem. Um, be careful with mon nodes in OpenStack because changing IPs is uh, not a fan because Libert uh, doesn't like this. And uh, Ceph upgrades. Don't forget the rest of the nodes, your compute nodes, your monitor nodes, um, and yeah. All right, so we really told you a lot of stuff that kind of went wrong. Um, so what, what makes it worth it? What makes it worth the effort of going through this and the growing pains? Um, I've done attached storage for the past 18 years. Um, this is probably the first time that I've actually come back around where I feel like I have total control of the cluster, how it operates, um, and it's just how expandable it is. Um, so one of the things is we're not locked into vendor-specific hardware. Um, you know, you can go from your name brand servers to your generic servers. Um, you can go as few OSDs or as many. You can go different tiers, different drives. You're not locked into anything that a, a vendor is typically going to make you kind of commit to. Um, scaling across racks, rows, and rooms. This is a big issue for us. Um, we're almost out of room in, in one of our data halls, and we're going to have to go to another data hall. Well, guess what? Ceph can do that. Um, we don't have any limitations. We're going to have sub-microsecond latency. Um, we don't, you know, it, it just, it kind of works, and that's the beauty of it. Um, data migrations. Nasty data migrations are a thing of the past. Um, for the past four or five years, I've been migrating off legacy end-of-life arrays onto new arrays, and those, by the time we get on those, they're almost end of life. Um, the nice thing about a Ceph cluster, you just kind of rack some new nodes, and it just, you know, automatically rebounces the data. Um, so whenever, you know, uh, your hardware is end of life, you can basically wait for it to die. And when it dies, you buy a new piece of hardware, rack it somewhere else, data gets moved on to it, you don't have to worry about um, going in between vendors or anything like that. Um, and this is probably the most important thing, is we actually have a say. Uh, there are a lot of Ceph people here. There are a lot of Ceph talks. Um, you know, we open a bug. If, if it's a use case bug, you can sit there and say, hey, why is this, you know, not doing the right thing? Like an out-of-family mon, uh, mon node upgrade, you know, for certain things they have, yes, yes, I really mean it. Well, if you're doing an out-of-family mon upgrade that you know is going to cause some issues, like why is that flag not there? Why is it not consistent? Um, so if you run into features or, or something that you think should be there, open a bug. Um, and the other thing is we, there's a session today uh, hosted by Dave that is going to actually help us gather more information and hopefully collaborate like on, um, you know, we do drive testing, other people do drive testing. Why is it not all in one area where somebody can do, you know, go out and look and say, you know, I don't need to go recreate and test like an Intel drive for a journal or, or a 7200 RPM 6 terabyte drive or so forth. So it makes it easier to kind of configure the, your first uh, cluster and kind of keep it out of that, you know, growing pains effort. So um, hopefully, like, you, you guys are taking away that, you know, this is definitely worth the time. It's worth the investment. You got to, um, you kind of got to be bold. You really got to, you know, make it kind of how, how you envision it. Um, so if, you, you know, we're going to open up for questions and comments, but um, you can always reach us. I think we're both on the Cinder channel and some other, most of the OpenStack channels. Um, 
And if you see us around, definitely you can pull us over, ask us questions. And uh, I think at that point, we can actually open it up for some questions if anybody has any. And I'm going to shamelessly plug the other Time Warner Cable Talks coming up. <laughs> the next one's right next door. Uh, can you please speak into the mic? Um, so one of the things I was wondering is as you're expanding, did you see some of the bottlenecks moving to the network and did you have to look at that and what kind of network we're using, like a back end or? Yeah, so we're kind of lucky. We, we built this all from scratch. So all of our ports are 10 gig ports. Um, with all storage, you just have to choose where your bottleneck's going to be. So, um, you know, ideally, if I can get the network to be my bottleneck, I, that's where I want it. Because that's just, you know, I can go blame the network team and say, you got to up upgrade us to 40 gig ports. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you got to watch with that because uh, we're getting into some solid state nodes. And if you're going to go dense with the, the amount of, uh, you know, drives you have, you have riser cards and different stuff. So, yeah, it's, when you're sitting down and designing it, choose your bottlenecks wisely. You don't want it to be on you, you want it to be on somebody else. Right. So. If I could just ask one more. Yeah. Um, I see one of the things you're going to do is go to an all SSD type of array. Mm -hmm. Do you see the bottleneck moving to maybe CPU utilization then at that point where you're going to have very fast I.O., will you shift it, not for the network maybe this time, but maybe the CPU? I definitely see that. Um, yeah, I like think some of our early investigations, yeah. like basically by the fastest CPUs we can get. Yeah, it, and work, I, but we're going to find yeah. that out. I think it's going to be more backplane issues than CPU, to be honest. I mean, it'll be, it'll be close. It'll be one of those two. But um, again, if we eliminate that, if we, if we go to a, a less dense node, we, you know, it comes down to CPU or network at that point. So. OK, thank you. A uh, uh, question about live migration. You said that's really important for you. Did yeah. you manage the Nova part of the storage also with Ceph, or did you do yeah. something different for Nova? No, so um, with Ceph, <laughs> excuse me. We have Glance and Cinder, um, so we have, uh, we're, we're doing no ephemeral storage, so everything, all of our RBD instance volumes are on Ceph, so that's the, the, the magic. Now, Nova itself, like Liver, requires a shared volume or SSH abilities in between nodes to copy certain files over. Um, so, yeah, in terms of Nova, it's all, you know, booting off of Ceph, so. Okay, thanks. Hey, just uh, first a comment. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it sounds like you guys are having exact same issues as, uh, as, as us and probably a lot of other people, so it's kind of refreshing to, uh, to hear that. Um, quick question. Uh, have you guys uh, looked at uh, tiering at all? Uh, I, I think I, I didn't hear that uh, in the talk. So it's, on, it, it's kind of on our roadmap. We've actually, um, and this is actually another nice point to Seth, we're actually treating it more like a development lifecycle roadmap than an end-of-life hardware roadmap. So, as new things get deployed with Ceph, we're, we're, we're rapidly kind of evolving our cluster. So it is on the roadmap. Um, I think one of the things we're, we've been talking about is waiting for some of the, like the NVMe drives. Um, it just allows us to build kind of some faster, denser cache nodes. Um, and then there was other talk that we spoke with Red Hat, who we have a, a support contract with about, you know, if you want, you can just put all your primary PGs on just your SSDs, and that really speeds stuff up. So we haven't decided where to go. We're a two-man team supporting 60-some Ceph nodes, and that's only like a quarter of our job. So um, yeah, because we have a, a lot of say in live migration, and, and it's how some of the other stuff works. But it, yeah, tiering I'm excited about. And we're st actually starting to look at RBD cache, and I know there are some issues with RBD cache and, and how the client accesses it, whether they're going to use direct I.O. if they're using a Linux box, or if it's going to be cached in the file system local on the instance. So, yeah, we're trying to work out all those bugs, but it takes time. Okay, thanks. Hi, guys. Hi. I, I'm curious how you, how you actually expanded the cluster. Did you, did you sort of just put it all in production at once, or did you do one disk at a time or one host at a time? Like how, how, well, okay, so that's a learning curve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so whenever we actually brought the first node, it automatically brought everything in, and we didn't even want that. So we actually wanted to take a tiered approach bring in one OSD, and it caused major issues. All of a sudden, like I said, be prepared to scare your teammates, because all of a sudden you're doing something that's normal, and everything gets slow, customers complain. Um, and then, you know, once you 
actually start getting to a point, and this is something yeah. you, you were talking about, is you get past some of the peering issues, which is the biggest you know, bottleneck for us. Well, peering in, at the yeah. same time as like the backfill recovery yeah. process just seems to be a performance But hit. the bigger you get, it's now where we, I mean, we have it scripted. We brought on 100 and, or what was it? No, 60 some OSDs yeah. and it never even like blinked. So but that's because we got the yeah. process down right. Basically yeah. stop all backfill process from going on while we're adding in the notes. Yeah, there, there are some and settings. don't do too many at yeah. the same time so you don't have a peering process going on on one OSD when you're bringing up the next OSD. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's, then once so it's so all so done, so then so you... So you've saved scripted to bring in one OSD at a time? Yeah. So, okay. there, there are some flags that you should, you know, some things you should disable. And by all means, definitely reach out to us. Um, and we can tell you exactly what we used. Cool. So. And if you know a better way, please let us know. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, don't, I think, I think that's, a, it's a, it's an area for improvement, I think. Okay. Because this is, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Hi, uh, you mentioned performance. What kind of actual aggregate throughput did you get out of your array and how did that change as you scaled up? Out of the cluster? Out of the cluster. Um, so it's kind of, this is where we're kind of like, di <laughs> we differ in opinion. So as we test it out, um, I'm used to using VD Bench, which is a SPC, you know, Storage Performance Council, you know, standard. Um, a lot of people are using FIO, which I, I, again, I'm, I'm happy with. Um, some of our customers use Bonnie Plus Plus. So, um, you know, we, we kind of see there are different ways to test the characteristics. I look at just I.O. Um, he likes to look at file transfers. So right now, our cluster, it's not necessarily that it's like super busy, but it's doing large blocks. So we're doing 9,000 IOPS or something on uh, in, you know, average, but they're very large block sizes. It's not like 40,000 4K blocks. They're, I don't know, probably 32, 32K or bigger. Some of these ranging almost up to 512. So it's, um, I mean, it's performing. I mean, we're, you know, right now we're not, uh, we have no complaints and we're running some very intense stuff that you wouldn't think you run on the cloud, like logging applications that are always writing. Um, the, the customers just aren't complaining. It's like 300, ter <laughs> 300 terabytes. I think. Yeah. Uh, well, or no, say 300, 300 gigabit, gigabytes per instance. So, uh, you know, we're seeing the throughput. And again, it's just, it comes down to the drives. Eventually, we're going to run out of, we're going to run out of performance. Well, the other thing we did is we did 10K spindles. So we didn't do any 7200 uh, RPM spindles, and that helps out. Um, that kind of came from my performance, back, or my background doing storage, always plan on performance, never capacity. Like, customers always just assume that you're get, they're getting a Ferrari. So, but they don't want to pay for it. So I, I know that probably doesn't totally answer your question, but I mean, if you have a, if we can get more specific afterwards, we can definitely. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'd like to ask, what's your approach for Ceph deep scrubbing? Do you delay it or do you just let it run on a weekly basis? And do you also experience performance bottleneck while deep scrubbing is running? So we did initially with the very small cluster, but as the cluster has gotten yeah. bigger, we haven't <coughs> noticed it as much. It could be because it was added yeah. in so many different stages. They're all happening at different times. Yeah, we, we were actually talking about this last night, and, and we're not seeing the issues um, that other people are, and we actually think it's blind luck that we're not, mm -hmm. all, all of our volume groups aren't doing it at the same time. So uh, there are a lot of good um, you know, resources or, or pages that you, that you were reading, and they say about like modifying the clock, so whenever it, you know you're spreading out how it's doing deep scrubbing, because if you do get you know all your your not modifying the clock, more like just scheduling the well, uh, scrubbing yeah. process. Yeah. Fine. So, um, so yeah, you can change the countdown timer. So, um, yeah. So yeah, if, I mean, you know, the, we really don't have our cinder volumes and our gland, or our instance volumes are really the only two that are heavily used. Our glance uh, group doesn't get used that much, so whenever it's deep scrub, nobody ever complains. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, two related questions. How do you handle the resiliency issues, like when the drive fails, uh, do you get notified? How do you replace it, and does it automatically sort of replacement drive start getting used automatically? And the related question is, how do you handle the the mon monitor servers going down, do you have to ever replace them or 
how do we handle the reliability of Mon server during the upgrades? Okay, so I'll handle the first part if you handle the second part. <laughs> um, so we actually built out uh, Isinga. So we're, and there are some really free, nice uh, Ceph health checks that are out there. So we get notified of an OSD or a node going down uh, before it, you know, any of our customers notice any kind of issues at all. Um, and, and with the size of our cluster now, our customers don't even notice. We failed a whole node uh, because of a bad uh, a storage adapter. We didn't fail it, it failed itself. Well, yeah, it failed, it, it failed itself. <laughs> and uh, we actually recovered from that in less than an hour and a half. Yeah, it was four terabytes so, of data that moved in an hour and a half. So that was pretty yeah. awesome. Compared and to um, our customers, we were still passing our 9,000 IOPS and nobody ever complained. So, and that's with all the recovery traffic. But yeah, and whenever we actually have something that goes down, um, so for instance, we actually marked, marked this out of our puppet so it's no longer alerting people and trying to wake them up and at the same time, we're, we set it to not auto boot. So whenever we bring it in, it's actually gonna be on our terms, not because whenever you bring it in, it's gonna start repeering and, and, and you know, changing the crush map, mm -hmm. you're gonna run into some issues and you just wanna, like I said, have it on your terms, not like it, you know, they replace the card, it automatically comes up and in the middle of the night, one of our teammates gets, you know, paged for no reason and they're mad at us. So we try to avoid that. In the so, mod node? No, I was going to go on to that a little bit more. It's like, yeah. that's one of the areas I want to look into because before I came to Time Warner, I was actually at Photobucket and we had around like 10,000 hard drives and auto support is great. Um, so like a drive fails, all of a sudden a day or two later, it shows, a new one shows up in the mail, you pop that in, throw the other one in the box and you're done. I wanted to get to that point. And that's some of the puppet work that I'll be working on. Um, but the mod yeah. nodes? Fa I, yeah, failed yeah. mod node. We just um, upgrade them one at a time. So, so take yeah. If we can rebuild any node in our cluster yeah. in about 20 minutes. Yeah, so we have, uh, we can actually evict a compute node in, in an emergency and, you know, re-IP it and, and use Puppet and Ansible and our cobbler server and we can rebuild it right into a Ceph mod node in, like Dave said, less than 20 minutes. So. That's, that's one of the ways that we kind of try and recover. But if a mon goes down, you're really, it, it depends on how many mon nodes you have, you're in a state where you're really got to react. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. the, my question was more, if you have like large number of nodes, yeah. and uh, now the mon's uh, nodes are like say five or some number, small number, chance of all of them going down at once might go up, so how do we handle that kind of? Of mon nodes or, or both mon and OSD? Um, mainly the mon nodes. Because so if you have, I mean, if you have all your mod nodes go down or, or you lose quorum, um, you're, you're kind of, you know, not in a good place at all. It doesn't, so, and that's again where you actually, I think it's important to, to reiterate, like you got to have a way to, to spin up an emergency mod node pretty quickly. Because um, if you actually have, uh, you know, four of your five mod nodes go down, well, you know, you basically lose your cinder operations and, and you're going to run into some RBD stuff where I think it's actually going to start, you know, eventually stop passing some data. So, yeah, you really got to have an emergency situation or emergency plan in place for that. Okay, thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to echo the sentiment. Thank you very much for the candor. Okay. Um, it, it's it, an awful lot of times some of the sessions wind up, the only thing missing is a revival tent. So I really appreciate <laughs> the actual, uh, you know, nice, nice candidates. Mm -hmm. I do have a couple of questions, however. I missed um, the applications that were this fault tolerant and the second part of that question is, what are the opportunity costs for another system that doesn't have such a low utilization rate for the, the costs involved and the time? So I miss what applications are running, who the customers are that oh, can tolerate so, this. Yeah, so um, unlike I think how a lot of people deploy this, our customers can run anything. Um, our vice president sat there and we're onboarding customers and it's stuff from video content to web portals to uh, logging applications, and uh, some people are trying to run databases. So our stuff is all over the board. It's not just like it's an imaging system that's capturing like thousands and thousands or millions of, of pictures and graphics. It's our I.O. is completely scattered and random. So you had mission critical applications on the system? Absolutely. And they were able to tolerate failure at every upgrade level? Yeah. Uh, early on, we actually had some issues with uh, a message queuing system. But as we actually expanded and our cluster got bigger, that whole window minimized. And once so, we streamlined yeah. the process to figure out the proper yeah. way to go about, you know, so we're running customer-facing applications. So we got 20 million people that have email and different things. Well, you know, that's their that's their that's their interface. So based on that, it goes to the second question. 
were you asked as part of the justification for going in this particular route for a, a cost benefit ratio of doing this particular solution for those applications versus a more traditional approach and what the cost differences were? Um, because you have so, you have every for every drive you have that's usable, you've got yeah. two others that don't. Obviously, that's the way it works. Yeah. But that's a very that's like a so, that's like a hard drive tractor pull. Yeah. So I, this is like a shameless plug, but the changing culture of Time Warner Cable, that like you know the the, the guys that are speaking to that are the people that actually are writing the checks for this stuff. Oh, so okay. for me to justify, hey, we're going to have a bunch of uptime and we can actually evacuate nodes. We do changes during the day. It's no longer nighttime changes. Like, you know, we don't have a bunch of burned out engineers working day and night. Like, you know, to them, that's worth the, the writing that check. Okay. So, um, that's the, but that's definitely a question for, for them. I mean, they'll be happy to field that for you. And, um, yeah, I, I don't have, I just say what drives I want to buy. No, and, I just was curious. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Thanks.